Hello and welcome to Radcliffe Cardiology's final webinar of the year, this time in association with the European Cardiology Review. I'm Harriet Seeger and I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor J.C. Kasky, our very own Editor-in-Chief of European Cardiology Review, who's going to talk to us about microvascular angina in women, a condition more common than initially thought and poses major diagnostic and therapeutic challenges. Professor Kasky, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us today. Just a quick note to our audience. Um, you'll have the opportunity to ask Professor Kasky some questions by the text box on your screen throughout the course of the webinar, and Dr. Kasky will answer as many as possible at the end. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to Professor Kasky. Thank you very much, Harriet. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to talk about microvascular angina today as I believe that this is an important field which actually requires a little bit more attention than is currently getting amongst cardiologists. Um, the focus today will be microvascular angina in women and I'll be talking about the diagnosis and the management of the uh, condition. Um, in this sort of um, half an hour or so, um, I will try to put the concept of microvascular angina in the context of the broader field of stable angina. I will talk a little bit about the pathogenesis of the condition because I think that this is absolutely vital to decide what treatment we are going to give to our patients. And I will spend a few minutes discussing um, how to manage these um, individuals who are affected by microvascular angina. And microvascular angina essentially is a diagnosis that implies the occurrence of chest pain caused by myocardial ischemia, which derives from abnormalities in the coronary microcirculation and is not necessarily caused by um, obstructive epicardial coronary artery disease. Stable angina, the more common form of uh, chest pain, is a fairly common and disabling condition. And in, in, in many cases we may feel, or cardiologists may feel, that stable angina is the poor relative of the more important acute coronary syndrome, this chronic condition um, actually causes lots of problems to <clears throat> men and women who are affected by um, angina. If you look at um, data on the prevalence of the condition in America, you will see that approximately 3.2% has been identified as the mean prevalence, and this increases with age reaching up to 11.9%, um, 12%. And it's interesting that when you age adjust the prevalence, you will see that this condition is higher among women. And this is, I think, quite an important concept. If you look at the um, age bracket 45 to 64, the prevalence in men will be approximately 2 to 5% and much lower in women. But when we move to the 65 to 74 year age bracket, then the prevalence in men and women is quite similar. So we are dealing with a common condition with a disabling condition. Very interestingly, and I am asked this question very often, people are interested to see how often we see um, cases which we could ascribe to microvascular dysfunction. This article by Manish Patel in the New England Journal um, um, a few years ago is, is extremely important and interesting. These authors look at um, around 400,000 patients with suspected coronary artery disease. The age was um, around 60 years, more or less similar proportion of men and women in the population, a large proportion of the individuals with diabetes, 70% suffering from hypertension. And when these subjects uh, were subjected to non-invasive testing for ischemia, uh, 
almost 70% had a positive test. But when the angiogram was carried out, only you could see that only 40% had uh, coronary artery disease. 60% had coronary artery stenosis less than 50%. And amongst these um, individuals, um, 40% of the patients had completely normal, practically just only irregularities in the coronary tree. And I think that this is a very important um, um, concept that we need to keep in mind. A common condition, 60% of the people coming to you with typical symptoms and risk factors for coronary artery disease will have no obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, so this is in a way telling us that, um, as the WISE data indicate, three to four million people in the USA have signs and symptoms of myocardial ischemia without having obstructive coronary artery disease. And the condition is more frequent in women who commonly have coronary microvascular dysfunction, uh, a reduced quality of life as a result of the frequent and prolonged pains. And very importantly, and we didn't know this um, some years back, they do have a higher risk of cardiac events. The, the reason why somebody with no obstructive coronary artery disease can have myocardial ischemia due to microvascular dysfunction is not obviously a new concept. And I think that most physicians nowadays would accept that a marked increase in the resistance to coronary blood flow at the site of the coronary microvasculature, which I have actually um, so drew here, I've drawn here, can actually trigger chest pain and electrocardiographic changes suggestive of ischemia. They can also trigger abnormalities of myocardial perfusion and um, left ventricular dysfunction in people who, as I said before, otherwise would have no um, uh, coronary artery disease. Keep, perhaps a concept which is a little bit um, novel compared to this one is the fact that coronary microvascular dysfunction, microvascular angina, can also occur in individuals who suffer from obstructive coronary artery disease. So both people with normal coronary arteries with a marked increase in the resistance to coronary blood flow at the site of the microvessels and individuals with coronary artery disease in whom the microvessels dysfunction can have microvascular angina. We knew um, about um, this kind of patients from the early, um, I would say probably early 80s, late 1970s, when uh, cardiac syndrome X was suggested as a possible um, subtype of angina uh, by Kemp and, and colleagues. Um, so these are individuals who have typical exertional chest pain and very often also angina at rest, who have transient electrocardiographic changes associated to the pain, which mimic, uh, cron mimic uh, coronary artery disease, but the coronary arteries are completely normal. We know that more than 50% of these people have myocardial ischemia, and also approximately 50% have coronary microvascular endothelial dysfunction that cause um, abnormal microvascular dilatation and ischemia. Um, when we started our investigations in cardiac syndrome X, we realized that this condition was more prevalent in postmenopausal women in most serious, and therefore estrogen deficiency was identified as a potential cause for the condition or as a possible mechanism to trigger the microvascular dysfunction. The association between estrogen deficiency and microvascular angina has been reported by several groups across the Atlantic, um, and this association is, in a way supports the notion that estrogen deficiency may play a role as a trigger for um, microvascular angina and can also represent a treatment target in a subgroup of women with microvascular angina. And I will come back to, to this when I discuss the treatment of the condition.
but it is uh, from from massive data in the literature nowadays. It is obvious that um, there are many pathways by which the um, estrogen and estrogen metabolites can influence some of the cells which are responsible for maintaining the normal cardiovascular function. And this uh, sort of diagram shows, for example, how estradiol, after meta being metabolized in the liver, the uh, metabolites can affect the circulation by um, affecting endothelial function, and there is a sort of tendency for estrogen to improve endothelial function favoring vasodilatation. Therefore, estrogen deficiency may favor vasoconstriction. And um, estrogen also acts um, as an anti-apoptotic um, uh, and uh, favoring relaxation of the smooth muscle cells. So a beneficial effect overall of estrogen on the cardiovascular system and the physiological um, conditions. Another important effect of estrogen that we need to consider in the context of microvascular angina is that um, there is an enhanced pain perception in many patients with microvascular angina. And um, the variations in uh, women's estrogen levels, whether during the menstrual cycle or during the pregnancy, can modulate brain's nociception. In other words, when estrogen levels are high, the brain's painkiller system responds more potently, releasing endorphins or encephalins, which um, act reducing the pain signals that are received by the brain. And there are several studies in the literature who, which, which have actually identified areas in the brain where estrogen acts modulating the natural painkiller system, the endogenous opioid um, uh, system. This is important in, in, in terms of treating um, uh, pain uh, in, in, in these individuals with microvascular angina because there are many ways in which the pain can be modulated. Now, what actually triggers microvascular angina. There are structural and functional mechanisms that can cause microvascular dysfunction in people with angina and normal coronary arteries. And this has been reviewed by Filippo Cre and Paolo Camici some years back. Um, amongst the structural causes, I have chosen for this slide just a few which I think illustrate the problem quite well. For example, in the presence of hypertension, particularly with left ventricular hypertrophy, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the, the myocyte hypertrophy and the perimyocytic fibrosis that actually develops in, in these individuals can limit uh, myocardial blood supply to the heart muscle. Um, there is also capillary rarefaction in hypertensive patients and in relatives of hypertensive patients even before they develop hypertension, which can limit blood flow to the myocardium, myocardium in these individuals. And there are many other um, structural causes, uh, say amyloid deposit plugging into the uh, microcirculation, limiting blood flow to the heart muscle. But more commonly, we deal with um, functional mechanisms as opposed to structural mechanisms. And these functional mechanisms can either impair the dilatation, the, the, the normal ability to dilate that these microvessels have, or can cause severe vasoconstriction. For example, uh, microvascular spasm, which triggers uh, rest angina. Usually, endothelial activation and dysfunction is present as the key functional mechanism. And conventional risk factors for coronary artery disease such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, are responsible for the microvascular dysfunction in a large proportion of patients. In postmenopausal women, estrogen deficiency can act uh, limiting the vasodilator ability of the microcirculation or even promoting uh, vasoconstriction. Similarly, and very importantly, the presence of chronic inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or 
systemic lupus erythematosus can trigger exactly the same abnormalities in the microvessels. And these two conditions are, um, of course, more common in women than men. The other question that my group in, in London has been asking for quite some time has been how often epicardial, distal epicardial spasm or uh, microvascular spasm can actually trigger uh, microvascular angina. Um, we had the opportunity of answering this question in a collaborative study that we carried out with uh, Peter Ong and Udo Sektman, Sektem in um, Stuttgart. We looked at um, um, around 300 patients with exertional angina who were undergoing diagnostic angiography for a uh, uh, possible presence of coronary artery disease. And we found that um, during angiogram, the angiogram, we, we saw that 46 of the total number of patients had stenosis more than 50% in at least one coronary artery, artery. And the rest had no coronary artery disease at all or um, a degree of non-obstructive coronary artery disease. What we did in those patients then we focused on those with normal coronary arteries or non-obstructive non coronary artery disease and asked them to undergo acetylcholine testing. Acetylcholine, as you are aware, can trigger coronary artery spasm in individuals who have a predisposition for spasm or in individuals with severe endothelial dysfunction. And what we found, and it was a very surprising finding, was that the acetylcholine test triggered either epicardial or microvascular spasm in more than 60% of these patients. And I would like to show you a couple of examples. This um, is a, um, a woman who had a typical uh, chest pain. Her angiogram showed no obstructions. Uh, when we injected acetylcholine, into the coronary arteries, the patient developed the usual chest pain and the electrocardiographic changes clearly suggestive of ischemia. When we administered uh, intracoronary nitroglycerin, the uh, vasoconstriction disappeared, the chest pain went away, and the electrocardiographic changes also disappeared. And you can see that what actually caused the angina and the electrocardiographic changes in these patients was this severe distal uh, vasoconstriction of the epicardial arteries. And this is another very interesting example. This time, the injection of acetylcholine caused no changes in the caliber of the epicardial coronary arteries, but triggered the pain and the electrocardiographic changes suggestive of myocardial ischemia. The uh, administration of nitroglycerin relieved the um, chest pain and the electrocardiographic changes without affecting the diameter of the large vessels. And this is telling us that what triggered the ischemia was not an epicardial problem, but a microvascular uh, problem. And unfortunately, we cannot image angiographically these micro vessels. Acetylcholine does was very important to identify the cause of ischemia in these patients with normal coronary arteries. Let me tell you that acetylcholine is safe in trained um, units to make a diagnosis of coronary artery spasm or microvascular dysfunction. Having microvascular spasm at as in the case of this patient uh, I just mentioned to you, is not a trivial thing. We looked at individuals who had um, the kind of microvascular spasm that I described in, that, um, in those previous slides and saw whether the spasm was associated with any objective evidence of um, vascular dysfunction um, and functional um, contractile abnormalities. And we observed that in association with the electrocardiographic changes suggestive of ischemia and the chest pain, these individuals had reversible ischemic changes on SPECT, myocardial perfusion imaging, 
and um, echo uh, um, cardiographic assessment. And some of these patients also showed an increase in the concentration of high sensitivity cardiac troponin. This is telling us that a microvascular spasm can, can result in microvascular in, in, in contractile dysfunction and also in a degree of uh, myocardial damage. So, as I said before, not a trivial phenomenon. And that this is not a trivial problem is um, evidenced by results of studies like this one, um, published a few years ago by the group of Eva Prescott in Denmark. They looked at a very large number of chronic stable angina patients who have been referred for coronary arteriography and compared these individuals with normal controls bil um, taking part in the uh, Copenhagen City Heart Study. Um, <clears throat> the um, angiogram showed that there were more women than men amongst those with no obstructive coronary artery disease in this large group of patients. And what they observed is that looking at follow-up and outcome during follow-up, that both in men and women, individuals with um, um, chest pain, despite normal coronary arteries, did worse than individuals in the control group. And this is um, quite an important finding, indicating that prognosis may not be as benign as we initially thought in these patients. And both the WISE investigators in the USA and uh, other groups in Europe have actually documented that um, a, a poor prognosis, um, whether it be cardiac death, acute demise, stroke, or new onset of HF in um, individuals with chest pain and normal coronary arteries is associated with reduced coronary flow reserve. In other words, with an abnormal um, coronary flow reserve due to microvascular problems. And this was also found um, in this group um, published by Marcelo De Carli and uh, colleagues in the States, where um, both men and women with um, abnormal coronary flow reserve, as assessed by positron emission tomography, had worse prognosis than individuals with normal flow reserve. So prognosis may not be as good as we initially thought. Now, how do we, in our everyday practice, identify patients who come to us with chest pain um, to characterize them or classify them as microvascular angina? Say, if, if we start from the clinical history, say they come to us with no previous um, evidence for normal coronary arteries or any um, uh, sort of objective evidence for um, coronary artery disease, the clinical history will give us very good clues as to whether microvascular angina may be present in these patients with chronic stable angina. They tend to come with effort and rest angina, the episodes tend to be prolonged and shortness of breath with or without the pain um, during effort are fairly common, particularly in women with microvascular angina. And they will tell you that they are often extremely tired after the episodes of chest pain. We will look, of course, at whether there are possible pathogenic mechanisms able to trigger microvascular dysfunction. So we will look at traditional risk factors, we look at diabetes, hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy. We will see whether estrogen deficiency may be playing a role. We will also investigate whether there are chronic inflammatory conditions able to cause microvascular dysfunction. Then we normally would send these individuals for tests for um, myocardial ischemia. And amongst those, we will resort to stress echocardiography, particularly to look at effort-induced um, uh, myocardial ischemia, and we will also look at myocardial perfusion uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And we found that the use of magnetic perfusion, magne uh, of myocardial perfusion magnetic resonance testing has been extremely useful in identifying subendocardial myocardial ischemia. 
if these tests are positive, we will not hesitate to send this patient for coronary arteriography. But even if the tests are borderline, or we are convinced that the chest pain, irrespective of the absence or presence or absence of myocardial ischemia in these tests, suggest the possibility of microvascular spasm, then we will send the patients for coronary arteriography. And coronary arteriography will be useful to identify whether there are obstructive plaques or the arteries are completely normal. And will be also an opportunity to do tests for spasm, the acetylcholine test. And also tests to measure coronary flow reserve invasively using adenosine and the flow wire. If your patients come to you from other centers who are, have already done a coronary arteriogram, arteriogram and tell you that the arteries are normal, then we will just change the process and will actually go back and from the angiogram, knowing that the arteries are normal, we will do tests for myocardial ischemia to see if there is um, microvascular dysfunction associated with increased oxygen demand. And if necessary, we will send the patients to uh, coronary arteriography again for tests of coronary artery spasm. I'm really advocating the use of acetylcholine um, in a wider scale than it is used at the moment because I believe that this test is vital to give patients a diagnosis and giving patients diagnosis will help in their uh, management. I will skip this for, for a minute. There are attempts to characterize the, the, the severity of the microvascular and angina using non-invasive techniques. And this is a study by Noel Berry Merz and Carl Pepin in the USA, in the WISE uh, group, um, where uh, they have identified an index which um, has good sensitivity and specificity for the identification of coronary microvascular dysfunction, it correlates extremely well with invasive assessment of coronary flow reserve. But larger studies are required to actually um, confirm that this test has utility in clinical practice. Okay, now we have identified that microvascular angina is the mechanism responsible for ischemia in um, our patients, how do we treat these individuals? I would say that the um, key point here is to try and identify the prevailing pathogenic mechanism in your individual patient and then tailor the treatment to the individual needs. There are no off-the-shelf um, uh, treatments for these patients and although Microvascular angina patients look very similar or almost identical. They are different, and they may have different mechanisms triggering the angina. There are common things that we need to treat. If endothelial dysfunction is present, and we can assess this directly or assume that it may be present if the risk factors are several, then we need to focus on aggressively treating, treating uh, the risk factors for coronary artery disease. We should resort to the administration of statins, exercise advice, and ACE inhibitors to try and improve endothelial dysfunction. And we do this in, in our practice in most patients coming to us with microvascular angina. Some of these patients have um, anxiety as a result mainly of not being properly reassured or not being given a proper diagnosis. So psychological mechanisms may be playing a role um, and cognitive and behavioral therapy, um, simple relaxation techniques can be extremely helpful in contributing to um, improving the abnormality. I'm not saying that these individuals have the chest pain because they have psychological problems, although small proportion may have um, 
that as a trigger, but because psychological abnormalities, particularly anxiety and depression, usually result for a, for, from a lack of a proper diagnosis. And, um, and as I said um, in, in some of the previous slides, um, pain threshold may be reduced in patients with microvascular dysfunction, and um, increasing the pain threshold with imipramine or amitriptyline acting as analgesic at the central level or with aminophylline may help managing these patients. There are other ways of dealing with uh, pains, but I will have no time to actually um, uh, develop this in um, greater detail. Now, if we have identified the presence of microvascular angina and ischemia, then we have very specific targets. I would suggest that the approach to treating ischemia in these patients is by trying to identify what is the prevailing mechanism. If angina in these patients results from an increased oxygen demand because the microvessels cannot dilate and give enough blood supply um, due to tachycardia or high blood pressure, then a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker of the kind of um, uh, deltaism or evavradin can be useful to block this triggering mechanism. If the problem, however, is angina at rest, mainly, and we have identified coronary artery spasm where a distal, epicardial, or microvascular, then you don't, need a, you don't use a beta blocker, even if the patient has angina, or evavradin. You use a nitrate, a calcium channel blocker, or nicorandyl, a potassium channel opener, with vasodilating actions. If the problem is triggered by metabolic abnormalities or the microvascular dysfunction that can occur in patients with ischemia triggered by other mechanisms such as coronary artery disease, then you will give drugs like ranolazine, which blocks the uh, um, late sodium current in the myocardium and that, in this way, you will block the accumulation of calcium into the myocardium, and that way you will uh, reduce the microvascular compression uh, that this mechanism uh, triggers. And trimetazidine does something similar by changing the metabolic pathways within the myocardium and reducing the acidosis that um, stiffens the myocardium. If our patients are individuals with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or have other cause for um, inflammation, systemic or local, then you need to block the, me the inflammatory mechanisms. You would use biological agents to treat the rheumatic diseases or you use statins and colchicine to treat um, other forms of inflammation. If the problem is an impairment of the coronary microvascular dilatory ability, uh, then you treat the risk factors aggressively. You try to improve endothelial dysfunction by different means, including ACE inhibitors, statins, metformin, or give estrogen if you can document that there is a link between estrogen deficiency and um, the microvascular problem. Um, there are several studies, not in very large number of patients, suggesting that short-term treatment with um, transdermal administration of the estrogen may be useful and short-term and transdermal administration may avoid gynecological problems that may be derived from the administration of um, um, estrogen to women who may be predisposed to uh, carcinomas. The use of, of, of metformin, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, this is a study carried out in the UK a few years ago showing that metformin improves exercise capacity, reduces ST segment depression and chest pain during um, the stress test in individuals who have microvascular dysfunction, women who have um, angina with normal coronary arteries caused by microvascular dysfunction um, 
and even in the absence of diabetis. And the reason why metformin seems to be having this beneficial effect is through an endothelium-dependent improvement of the um, vascular function. ACE inhibitors are useful in large proportions of these patients. We have many years ago published data with enalapril showing that this drug can improve exercise capacity, reducing ischemia during exercise, and recently a very or a larger, much larger study by the WISE investigators showed how in women with microvascular dysfunction um, and in the absence of coronary artery disease, the administration of ACE inhibitors can improve, as we shown previously, the um, um, uh, ischemic um, uh, symptoms. So estrogen is another, another element, another useful uh, uh, medication that we can resort to. So I think we can conclude from the data I have presented today that microvascular angina is a common and debilitating condition that can affect men and women, but particularly women. The diagnosis of microvascular angina has to be suspected in the first instance, and it is based on the assessment of coronary vascular function and dynamic imaging, not just looking at the anatomy with an angiogram. Myocardial ischemia caused by microvascular dysfunction can be um, the result of abnormal vasodilatation or vasospasm, and the symptoms may <clears throat> give clues as to which of these two is the prevailing one. The therapeutic targets have to be based on understanding the pathogenesis, and one has to strive to, under, to, to try and understand the mechanism causing ischemia in your individual patient. And we do have both pharmacological um, elements, and I mentioned them um, before, and uh, pharma, non-pharmacological treatments, which are usually effective. And amongst the non-pharmacological treatment, changes in the lifestyle um, are absolutely vital. So I think that we are, I mean, these are exciting times for cardiologists who, with an interest in myocardial ischemia because the problem of microvascular angina is becoming more apparent and is um, a, an area where we would really benefit from more people getting involved, both in identifying patients clinically and in trying to understand the mechanisms that cause this condition. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Kasky. It was such an informative and practical presentation. Um, we've had some questions in from our audience, um, which I'm going to ask you now, if I may. Absolutely. Super. The first one, do inflammatory mechanisms play a pathogenic role in microvascular angina? Yes, I have actually shown um, one slide um, where I mentioned that uh, individuals with rheumatic diseases such as lupus or arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis um, can have a predisposition for microvascular angina. We have done a couple of studies not so long ago in these individuals where we identified that the chronic inflammatory process is responsible for microvascular uh, dysfunction and ischemia. So we now um, have a rather low threshold to actually treat uh, these patients with chronic inflammatory conditions with um, antianginal or at, at least medications which improve endothelial function. And of course, we, we really um, try to make sure that the basic inflammatory mechanism causing the rheumatic problem is well controlled. So the combination of improved endothelial function, good control of the systemic inflammation, and in some cases, um, um, anti-ischemic agents are useful to reduce the pain in these patients. Okay, thank you. Um, second question, can microvascular dysfunction cause low ejection fraction or cardiomyopathy? Um, there, is, there are data, there are some very old animal experiments showing that microvascular spasm can actually cause cardiomyopathies, and these are small animal experiments. Um, there is some evidence in uh, patients that um, 
microvascular angina, dysfunction or microvascular angina, particularly in individuals presenting with left bundle branch block, can go on to have um, abnormal um, uh, con contractility and uh, reduce ejection fraction over time. So I think there is we are, we are getting um, more evidence for a possible effect, long-term effect of microvascular dysfunction, um, albeit the mechanism is not well understood at present. Um, I mean, this this microvascular dysfunction can actually lead to uh, ventricular dysfunction. Okay, thank you. Um, third question: Diabetic microvascular disease can it be pathophysiology for microvascular angina? Indeed. Indeed, and a very important one, a very important one. And um, again, several studies in the literature have shown that um, diabetes per se, and uh, if um, in addition to that uh, there is documented um, microvascular spasm or an abnormal vasodilatory capacity of the vessels, that can lead to changes in cardiac metabolism favoring acidosis in the myocyte and also favoring stiffening of the muscle of the myocardium, making more difficult for the microvessels to deliver the blood flow supply to the heart. So yes, a very important, a very important mechanism, mechanism with with, with several uh, sub uh, sort of mechanisms responsible for the for the problem. Thank you. Um, next question: Why is MVA more frequent in women? Um, I think that one of the reasons um, is the fact that, uh, particularly in, in, in perimenopausal or postmenopausal women, the, uh, the loss of the beneficial effect of estrogen can predispose to vasoconstriction of the microvessels, and I think this could be one of the one of the one of the possible mechanisms. Uh, there are there, there are some there is some speculation, particularly in relation to Takotsubo which is an acute um, cardio, form of cardiomyopathy, stress cardiomyopathy, uh, apical ballooning syndrome, broken heart. I mean, it's got many, many names. Um, Takotsu is also more common in, in, in postmenopausal women. I think estrogen deficiency appears to play a role. Um, and there is also the possibility that uh, microvessels in women um, are less... Um, I'm, I'm more prone to actually being affected by what one could call sympathetic uh, storms or increased catecholamine surges. The, the, again, not very clear why the lack of estrogen modulation favors that, but, but it looks as if, if the microvessels tend to behave, behave more abnormally in women than in, in men. Okay. Next question, is MVA a heterogeneous condition? Yes, it, 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 it's bound to be because the microvessels are affected by so many things, the microenvironment and the systemic sort of um, environment, neurogenic um, mechanisms can trigger uh, these abnormalities in the microvessels, metabolic uh,
No? Okay, well, wishing you an excellent rest of day, and thank you and goodbye from Radcliffe Cardiology.